Good morning. Well, winter finally came. That's nice, right? For those that don't know you, my name is Ross Gilbert, and I'm the, the lead pastor here at uh, New Life Fellowship, and we're thrilled to have you here. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Uh, we like to have fun. We like to laugh, and I thought this would be an appropriate way to kind of start our morning. Uh, St. Peter is questioning three married couples to see if they qualify for admittance to heaven. Uh, why do you deserve to pass the pearly gates, he asked one of the men, who had been a butler. I was a good father, he says. Yes, but you were a drunk all your life. In fact, you were so bad, you were even married a woman named Sherry, no admittance. St. Peter turned to the next man, a carpenter, and he asked him the same question. And the carpenter replied that he'd worked hard and taken good care of his family. But St. Peter also rejected him, pointing out that he'd been an impossible glutton, so much so that he married a woman named Candy. At this point, the third man, who'd been a lawyer, stood up and said, come on, Penny, let's get out of here. <laughs> there are so many jokes about St. Peter in the uh, standing at the pearly gates and, and that being the judgment. And some of them are funny and some of them are not so funny and some of them are just downright bad. But all of them are rooted in really bad theology. They're all rooted in the idea of that that's what judgment's going to look like to see whether or not, based on what you've done, you've qualified to enter into heaven. Now, some teachers see a conflict of this idea here of, or just the idea in general of judgment and grace. And so what ends up happening is because of that conflict, they end up jettisoning, jettisoning, jettisoning getting rid of, we'll say it that way. <laughs> they get rid of one in order to keep the other. So, for example, some might say, well, you know, we see judgment, and so we're going to get rid of grace, and now we're going to have, have that judgment part. Or they get rid of judgment and just ignore that and only have grace. The, the problem is Scripture clearly speaks to both of them, and so both have to coexist. And so that's kind of what we want to look at. So the problem is when you think of the word judgment, what often comes to mind? What kind of feelings comes to mind when you, when you think about it? Just kind of shout some of those feelings out. Caught? Shame? Sorry? Harsh? I get, I, I feel like the best way I can describe the feeling is like when you're in school and then the teacher asks you to stay behind after class. Like, how does that feel? Like, is anyone really excited at that moment? Or the teacher looks at you and says, uh, the principal wants to see you in the office. I mean, that, that doesn't, I mean, Alan, you know all about that, right, that growing up, right? I mean, that, that just does not feel good. You don't enjoy that kind of a, of a sense of dread. I mean, to this day, I drive by a police officer on the side of the road, and I get a little nervous every time looking in the rearview mirror to see, is he going to pull out? And I just, you just have this expectation, this connotation attached to it, right? And that's, I think, what's happened here with this idea of judgment. We just feel like we're going into this final exam. Did I study enough? Did I, do I know enough answers? Am I going to pass the test? And so there's so much fear associated with that. Well, in my, my study this week, I came across this quote that I think both summarizes the situation and then explains the reason for it. And this one author, he writes this. He says, within the church, there exists a good deal of confusion and disagreement concerning the exact nature of the judgment. The use of the term judgment seat in most translations ignore ignorance of the historical and cultural background concerning the original language and foggy theology regarding the finished work of Christ have all contributed to several common misconceptions which in one way or another see God as giving out just retribution to believers for sin or at least for our unconfessed sin. So basically, that's how they viewed it. They viewed this idea of, of Judgment Day as a time where God then finally pays us back for all of our sin, or at least some of our sin. Now, when I look at that, I can understand why that might appeal to some people. That kind of thinking, to, particularly to some church leaders, how they could use that now as a way to control the people in the church. I have one friend, he was, he was trying to share grace and teach grace to another pastor. And, and after about six months, this pastor says, he, I finally get it. I understand it, but I can never teach it. 
Because if I ever taught that, if I ever taught God's grace, then those people, my people, they would just run naked through the streets. And my friend said, well, now I know what you would do. But he says, they're not your people to control. That's not what it's about. But that's often what ends up happening with the judgment. It's both the carrot and a stick. It's a carrot in the sense of if you behave well, and if you do enough right things, and if you do so and so, then God will reward you and everything will be okay. But if you don't, or when you don't, more, more accurately, then now we bring the stick in. Now God's going to punish you. He's going to take this away and he's going to hurt you because you're a wicked and rebellious servant that isn't dedicated and committed enough to him. And so this judgment or the threat of it becomes a tool for control and manipulation through guilt and shame to get what you want. Does that sound like the freedom in Christ that he came to give us? No, not at all. The problem is we can't ignore the fact that there is a judgment day. Scriptures speak to that over and over again. We're going to see a lot of those verses this morning. In fact, we're going to look at all kinds of verses this morning because really what we want to do is we want to take away the foggy or downright bad theology that surrounded this idea of judgment so that we can have confidence. We can look forward to this day, in fact, as we're about to see. So let's pray, and we're going to invite the Holy Spirit then to, to be our teacher this morning. Heavenly Father, there has been so much wrong thinking, misunderstanding, uh, wrong under, uh, beliefs around this idea of judgment. And yet you tell us that a, a judgment day is coming, but it's not something that we need to dread. It's not something we need to be afraid of. And so, Father, as we look through your word this morning and, and a number of different verses, we invite your Holy Spirit to be our teacher, to help us to, to take away the cobwebs, to straighten up our understanding so that we can see freedom and life in you. In your name we pray, amen. So for our discussion this morning, we need to recognize that there are two main judgments that we need to understand. And they're not happening at the same time. They're the distinct separate judgments. And so the, the first one we're going to look at is called the great white throne judgment. And, and they get that from a passage in Revelation chapter 20, uh, where the apostle John, he writes this. This is the, the, the scene of this is right before there's a new heaven and new earth. So it's sort of the end of this age, and then we're about to step into eternity. And right before that, he says, in verse, uh, verse 11, he says, Then I saw a great white throne, and him who sat upon it, from whose presence earth and heaven fled away, and no place was found for them. And I saw the dead, the great and the small, standing before the throne, and books were opened. And another book was opened, which was the book of life. And the dead were judged from the things which are written in the books according to their deeds. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it. And death and Hades gave up the dead which were in them. And they were judged, every one of them, according to their deeds. Then death and Hades are thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. So we see here this, this great white throne, this judgment. Now, the question we have to ask first is, who is this judgment for? Who does it apply to? It applies to those who have never received Jesus, to those who have rejected Jesus, who have denied him as Savior and Lord. So then the next question is, well, what is it about? Why is there this judgment? Because that's really important that we understand. And, and again, it's a, not a judgment of, of their lives per se, as much as it is a judgment of the rejection of Jesus. Now, on the surface, this might seem kind of petty. This might kind of seem like that God is this insecure, uh, you know, very uh, un, you know, unsure of himself kind of God, and he's feeling hurt by the rejection. And that might be how it's perceived. Sort of like a, a certain unnamed president to, of an unnamed country, right? Where if you have any kind of criticism that, you know, his presidency isn't really great and huge and the best ever, then, you know, you're really bad. And, and they kind of might look at that. Well, God's just being really petty for, for punishing these people in this case. But that's not it. That's not the desire of God. See, please understand, he takes no pleasure in this punishment, in this negative judgment. That's not what he wants. It's the last thing he wants. The best way I could describe it, it's like the husband who's married to a wife, who wants everything to do, and every, doing everything in his power to stay married to that wife, but she refuses to do so. 
And so they're apart. He can't control it, but he wants to. See, here's a number of verses to show the desire of God. 2 Peter 3, verse 9. The Lord is not slow about his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient towards you, not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. See, how many people would love for Jesus to come today? That'd be a wonderful thing, but you know what? I'm glad he's not, because it gives more time for people to accept him. And so be patient. Come, but you know what? Save more people. 1 Timothy 2, verse 4, God desires all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. That's his desire. He didn't choose some to be saved and for some to perish. Jesus loves the whole world. For God so loved the whole world. Nothing would bring God greater joy than to see the whole world come to faith in him. 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 9, For God has not destined us for wrath, but for obtaining salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. We, all of mankind, all of creation, was created with the intent that we would experience not wrath and punishment, but rather that we would experience intimacy with him, union with him, life with Jesus. That's what we're created for. And then we have maybe the most famous verse in the New Testament, John 3, 16, and then the verse afterwards, verse 17, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Verse 17, for God did not send his son into the world to judge the world, but that, through, that the world might be saved through him. God came to rescue mankind, not to condemn him, that's not God's heart. That's not his desire. It's not his purpose. It's a rescue mission he's on. It's a rescue that he's offering to everyone. All that remains is will you receive it? Will you take him up on the offer? And then John 3, 34 to 36, the, the same conversation he's having with Nicodemus at the end of the chapter. He says, for he whom God has sent speaks the words of God, for he gives the spirit without measure. I mean, he's just, he's just handing it out. Whoever will receive it. The Father loves the Son and has given all things into his hand. He who believes in the Son has eternal life, but he who does not obey. And the, the context there, obey, is, is connected to unbelief. He who does not believe, the Son will not see life, but the wrath of God remains or abides on him. See, God's not punishing the world who's rejected him out of anger and wrath. He's merely giving them what they've asked for. What they've asked for is a life without God. And God says, okay, but it's not going to be good. Let me, let me illustrate it to you this way. Uh, we've shared this illustration before many, many months ago, but we're going to share it again. But I think it's a great illustration here. Imagine the Titanic, right? You had hundreds of people on the Titanic, and then eventually it hits that, that iceberg. And then it didn't matter if you're rich or poor, everybody was off the boat right? One way or another. Some were in a lifeboat, others were in the water, but everyone was off the boat because the boat was sinking. Well, imagine now a rescue boat comes along. We'll call it the USS Jesus, right? And so Jesus shows up in the rescue boat and everyone there is, is drowning there. Everyone's suffering. Everyone's in trouble. And along comes Jesus and he, says, he reaches his hand, grab my hand and I will pull you to safety and I will rescue you. As believers, what have we done? We put our hand up, and he's grabbed us. We didn't even have to hold on to him. He simply grabbed our raised hand, pulled us into the boat, and we're now saved and we're rescued. But then you have other people, and they're sitting there treading in the cold, cold water. And they say, well, it's not fair. It's not right. It's not that bad. And they refuse to rescue. Is that now God drowning them? No. They've chosen to remain in the water and now they're choosing the consequences with that. And that's what Judgment Day is. It is God giving to the unbeliever what they've asked for, a life without him, which is no life at all. Does that make sense? So that's the first judgment, the, the great white throne judgment. We want to look at the other judgment, which is now what is often referred to as the Bema Seat judgment. So that's going to be for us as believers, and so the Bema Seat Judgment gets its, its uh, name from two verses in Romans 14, verse 10, this first one, where it says, But you, why do you judge your brother? Or you again, why do you regard your brother with contempt? For we will all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. 
And then again in 2 Corinthians 5.10, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one of you may be recompensed for his deeds in the body according to that which he has done, whether good or bad. So we're going to explain why this term uh, Bema seat is, is coming from that. But again, let's ask a couple questions again. So who is this judgment for? It's going to be for us as believers, right? For us who have placed our faith in Jesus Christ. The second question is, well, what is it about? Why is this judgment? What's being judged? Now, for me growing up, this is what I was taught. And, and it was kind of given to me in this illustration. Imagine all of creation, every man, woman, and child, all that's ever existed, gathering in this giant movie theater. And on the screen, on the movie theater, is going to be your life. And it's not just you, it's going to be everyone, right? It's going to be sort of, you know, all lined up in a row there sort of thing. But all of us are going to be have our lives projected on the screen here for all of creation, every man, woman, and child, and my mom, by the way, that's important, are going to see my life. Now, it's not going to be your whole life, right? Because who wants to watch you sleep and go to the bathroom? right? That's both weird and creepy. So it's the edited version of your life, right? They're going to kind of trim it down. Again, there's also a lot of people. So you're going to, basically, it's going to take the highlights. Think, think highlights from last night's Leaf game, right? And some of it's highlights, some of it's lowlights. All right, let's be honest. It's just going to be the lowlights of your life, right? It's going to be all the juicy parts, all the sin that's going to be projected up on that screen for all of creation, including my mom, to see. Doesn't that sound exciting? Right? And that's how it was taught to me. And so then, with that idea, who wants that experience? Right? So you have a couple options. Option number one is, well, sin less. Right? Make sure that your video is really short. Right? And kind of forgettable. And, and make sure the sins you choose aren't major sins. Make them minor sins. Right? So that's one option. Sinless. Option number two, make sure you go after Greg. Because if you go after Greg, it won't be so bad in comparison. Right? So when you get to heaven, find Greg, line up after him. That's basically the thinking. Those are your two options. Does that sound like a wonderful theology? No. No. See, in Jeremiah 31 and verse 34, the writer of Hebrews quotes that verse two times. Once in Hebrews 8, once in Hebrews 10, which means that verse shows up three times. Listen, does it say this? That I will forgive their iniquity and I'll remember their sins on judgment day. Is that what the verse says? No. What it does say is I will remember their sins no more. See, in Psalm 103, he says, I'm going to separate your sins as far as the east is from the west. And I'm so glad he said east and west, because when does the east meet west? It never does. See, as long as I'm going east, I'm always going east. If I'm going west, I'm always going west. The two never meet. So the distance between east and west is infinity. And he says, that's how far I've separated you from your sins. They're no longer connected to you. They're no longer attached to you. I've taken them away. In Romans 8.1, there is not one single condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And then in Hebrews 9.27 and 28, and in as much as it is appointed for men to die once, and after this comes judgment, so Christ also, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time for salvation without reference to sin to those who eagerly await him. See, what you need to understand is this second judgment, the judgment for you and I that we're going to face, is not about sin. He's already dealt with that sin. It's already been accomplished. That was what Calvary was all about, to take away the sin, to separate it as far as the east is from the west, to throw it in the sea of forgetfulness so that it's no longer applied to you, so there's no longer condemnation to you. And all that is possible because who God has made you. Because of the cross, because of our union with Christ, you're a brand new creation. You've already been judged and determined that you're righteous and you're acceptable. You see, not only have you been declared, no, no, there's something even better. You've been made righteous. 
You're a new creation, holy temple, living of the whole uh, living temple, the living God, who currently lives inside of you. You're one spirit with Him because you're joined to Him. See, the judgment that awaits you and I as believers is not a judgment of who you are. That's already been determined. That's already settled. The judgment that comes is going to be not about salvation, not about heaven and eternal life acceptance, because all of that has been determined. You've been saved by grace. To understand what the judgment is about, we need to understand what the Bema seat is referring to. So I said those two verses in Romans uh, chapter 14 and then in First Corinthians or Second Corinthians 5 talks about this judgment seat of God or judgment seat of Christ. And that's how it's been translated, judgment seat. But the word judgment seat in, in Greek is actually bima. And bima refers to a seat where a judge or official will reward a winning athlete of a competition. So what does that mean? How do we understand that? Well, think about the Olympics, right? We're going to have the Olympics this year, Summer Olympics, which is, if I had to pick one, is probably my favorite over, over winter. But to be honest, I love all Olympics, Right, and I watch all the Olympics, and so I'm excited. One of my favorite ones is the 100 meter dash. Right, so just kind of picture 100 meter dash. Right, so they're all there, lined up on their starting block. Gun goes off, boom, they take off. Right, they run 100 meters in under 10 seconds. They cross the finish line, and the guy that wins first one, he's the champ, gold medal winning. Right, and what happens next? Fans go wild. Fans go wild. All right, you got your cue that time, right? And they grab their flag right from their country, and they put it over their shoulders, and they do the lap, and fans go wild again. That's, you're getting better, right? You'll pass the test. So, you know, that's all happening. And then, then at the middle ceremony, where some official, some high-ranking government official or IOC official comes, and they award them with the gold medal and some flowers or a wreath or something like that. And then the fans go wild. Yay! Right? Well, the Bema seat was a, it's literally a raised platform, but it would be a seat where, uh, you know, Caesar or some other, you know, governor or high ranking official would be seated. And at the end of an Olympic competition or any game, really, any kind of uh, athletic competition, they would go, the winner would go present themselves to to that governor, to the Bema seat, to be rewarded, to, to celebrate the prize. I mean, think about it. Would after putting the gold medal on the guy who wins, would that same official then go to the guy that came in last and start beating him for coming in last? No. Because the Bema seat was not about punishment. The Bema seat was all about celebrating the reward of winning. That's what it was. So here's the thing. You and I, we will all face a Bema seat. We will all face a, a time not about negative judgment, not about condemnation, not about your sins, not about guilt and shame and humiliation, about your failures and shortcomings and what you did and didn't do. Instead, look what it says in 2 Corinthians 5.10. For we must all appear before the judgment seat, the Bema seat. We're all going to appear before the highest ranking official, Jesus Christ, sitting on his throne so that each one of you may be recompensed for his deeds in his body according to what he's done, whether good or bad. Now, here's the thing. The good or bad is not holy and unholy. It's not talking about righteous and unrighteous or what's, what's acceptable and what's evil, per se. It's not about sins. It's about something else. You see, it's really about whether or not we trusted in Jesus or we didn't trust in Jesus in the moments that we lived. It's a judgment on the works that we've done in our lives. See, let's look at a longer passage and see this, I think, in more detail. In 1 Corinthians 3, verses 11 to 15, <clears throat> Paul writes this, For no man can lay a foundation other than the one which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. So all that is saying, all that's referring to is your salvation. Your salvation is what? By grace alone, right? It's only by Jesus and what Jesus has done. You don't add a lick to it. You don't add 1% to your salvation. The foundation was Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone. 
Now, if any man builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, and straw. So now we've got that foundation of salvation. We're in Christ. Christ is in us. Now we begin to build on that. And we're building on that every day. Every day, every moment becomes another opportunity to lay something on top of that foundation. The question is, is it gold? Is it silver? Is it jewels? Is it precious stones? Or is it wood, hay, and stubble or straw? What are we building on top of this foundation? And, and that what that's referring to is the gold, the jewels, precious stones, and so forth. That's referring to what Christ does through us. That's the fruit of the Spirit. That's the, the works of Jesus as he lives his life through us. No longer I, but Christ who lives in me. But the wood, hay, and straw, that's the stuff that I do when I listen to the flesh. That's the stuff that I do in my own strength. And yes, some of that might be overtly sinful, lying and cheating and stealing and that sort of thing. You know, it might be obvious in the, those sins, but there might be less obvious sins. Because the reality is you and I, we can do all kinds of good looking things in our own strength. See, I could stand up right here right now and preach this message in my own strength. And it may not be very different, but Jesus would know. And there would be a difference. You could go, go to your job tomorrow and, and show up to work and you have a choice. Do I do it in my own strength or do I do it with Jesus living in me? And so whatever is done out of the flesh, whether it be good-looking flesh or bad-looking flesh, that's the wood, hay, and straw that is going to be built upon that. The question is, well, how do we know which is which? Well, the verse goes on. Each man's work will become evident, for the day will show it because it is to be revealed with fire, and the fire itself will test the quality of each man's work. If any man's work which is built on remains, he will receive reward. If any man's work though is burned up, he will suffer loss, for he himself will be saved, yet as through fire. So what does the fire do? It comes to the gold, and the gold doesn't catch fire, so it passes through. But what happens to the straw? What happens to the hay? What happens to the wood? <laughs> Goes up, and it's gone. Now here's, here's what's really cool. What did Paul say at the end? The person's still saved. Why? Because what's the foundation built on? Jesus. That's like a concrete foundation. That will survive any fire. That's not going anywhere. Right? So that's, that's not what this judgment's about. It's about who did I trust in in that moment? And it's all coming down to the motives that's in our heart that God knows and God's understanding, and he's going to begin to judge that. He's going to begin to examine that in our lives. That's what 1 Corinthians 4 or 5 says. Therefore, go, do, do not go on passing judgment before the time, but wait until the Lord comes who will bring to light all the things hidden in the darkness and disclose the motives of men's heart, and each man's praise will come to him from God. So it's about who is I relying upon in the moment? Who is I trusting in? Myself, the flesh, or is I trusting in Jesus? And that's what this judgment's going to be about. That's what's going to expose for us. And again, all of that comes down to what's going on inside. So it's not about the action anymore. It's about the source of the action. Who is it coming from? Now, at this point, some have objected. And this is why I think some have kind of tossed out this idea of, of judgment when it comes to grace and, and rewards and so forth, because it sounds like we're going back to a performance system. Where this idea that, you're yes, you're saved by grace, and, and that's there, but now we're being evaluated. Now we're being kind of, you know, making sure that your performance is, is doing okay. And quite frankly, a lot of us, well, we're coming up short. So you need to, you know, buckle down, pull up those bootstraps, try a little harder so that God will be pleased with you. And that's not the idea here. See, in that case here, we got a wrong concept or connection between the reward and the act. C.S. Lewis, I think he explains it so well in, in The Weight of Glory. So he says this, We must not be troubled by those who say that this promise of reward makes the Christianary life a mercenary affair. I love that idea, that phrase, mercenary affair. You think, what's a mercenary? A mercenary is a hired gun. 
They have no real uh, motives or values or uh, ideals other than themselves. I'm going to get paid. So one day, I'm fighting for this nation. The next day, I'm fighting for that nation. Right? One day, I'm on the side of G.I. Joe. The next side, uh, day, I'm on the side of Cobra. Right? It doesn't matter as long as I get paid, as long as I get my money, that's what I'm after. That's what I'm interested in. That's what a mercenary is. And so we must not be troubled by those who say this promise reward makes the Christian life a mercenary affair, where I'm just putting in my time to get my money, get my reward. There are different kinds of reward. There is a reward which has no natural connection to the things that you do to earn it. And it is quite foreign to desires that ought to accompany those things. Money is not the natural reward of love. That is why we call a man a mercenary if he marries a woman for the sake of her money. Does that make sense? Like if, if a guy marries a woman just so he can get rich off of her, that's not love. That's not right. That's a mercenary. That's not what's proper. But marriage is the proper reward for a real lover. And he's not a mercenary for desiring it. So if that same man, though, loves this woman, and sure, she's rich, but he loves her, and that's why he wants to marry her, then the money that comes with her is not a mercenary thing. It's just, it's a natural reward of their union, of their marriage. A general who fights well in order to get a promotion is mercenary. But a general who fights for victory is not. Victory being the proper reward of battle, as marriage is the proper reward of love. The proper rewards are not simply tacked onto the activity for which they are given, but they are activity itself in consummation. So the Christian then, he goes on to say, in relation to heaven is similar. Those who have attained everlasting life or eternal life in the vision of God doubtless know very well that it is no mere bribe, but the very consumption of the earthly discipleship. But we who have not yet attained it cannot know this in the same way and cannot even begin to know it at all except by continuing to obey and finding the first reward of our obedience in our increasing power to desire the ultimate reward. See, here's the thing. If you're living your life thinking, well, do I love this person? If I love this person, then I'm going to get a bigger reward. That's a mercenary thing. But if I think, no, I'm going to love this person because that's what I desire to do, and that's the most natural thing in me to do, and I go and I love that person, and God rewards you for that, that's not a mercenary thing. It's not even a performance thing. It's just merely the natural result or the natural conclusion of making good, healthy choices. Does that make sense? I hope this, you're beginning to see why we don't need to be afraid of Judgment Day now. See, Apostle John tells us in 1 John 4, verses 16 to 18, we have come to know and have believed the love which God has for us. God is love. And the one who abides in love abides in God and God abides in him. By this, love is perfected with us so that we may have confidence in the day of judgment. Because as he is, so also are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear because fear involves punishment. And the one who fears is not perfected in love. See, what Judgment Day is, it's a giant award ceremony. It's a giant graduation where before all of creation, all of heaven, you will be acknowledged for all those moments that you placed your faith in Jesus Christ. Here's what's, what's great about that is some of the things that we think, we, we really think this is going to, oh man, God's going to be so impressed by what I've done here. Not even realize necessarily that I was doing it in my own strength. That's the stuff that might go up in a big pile of flames. And then some other things that I didn't really see to be such a big deal, that's the stuff that will stay, that will stick around. See, in Matthew 25, Jesus tells the, the parable of the sheep and the goats and referring to the, the final judgment and how the sheep and the goats will be separated, goats to the left, sheep to the right. And then he's going to say to the sheep, come, those who my father has blessed, come and receive this inheritance that was prepared for you before the foundations of the world. That's this judgment. It's come. 
My father loves you. He's blessed you. He's spoken well of you. Come and receive, receive this thing that, you know what, for a long, long time, I've been waiting to give you. It's yours. Oh, why? Why, God? Why would we have this? Because when I was thirsty, you gave me water. When I was hungry, you fed me. When I was naked, you clothed me. And when I was lonely and languishing in a prison, you came and visited me. They said, but Jesus, we don't, we don't remember doing that. I mean, if we had known you were in prison, we definitely would have come and visited you. But we never saw you there. And Jesus says, if you did any of that to the least of one of them, you've done it to me. So look what's in the list. Giving a glass of water. Feeding someone, clothing someone, visiting someone. That's made the list. Notice what's not on the list. Starting a church. Becoming missionaries. Leading 500 people to Jesus. Leading one person to Jesus. All the things that we typically say, well, that's the righteous things that God's going to reward. And I do believe he's going to reward those things. But notice it's the small things that we're not even thinking about. That's the stuff that catches Jesus' eye. Because you know what, what, why we'll be rewarded for those so-called holy things of planting ministries and leading people to Jesus and what we ha what has in common with giving someone a glass of water? It's an act of love. That's it. And boy, God loves when his kids love other people. That's what he desires. That's what he longs for. Love one another. And when you do that, I'm going to celebrate that. And I'm going to reward you. And I'm going to acknowledge that. And all of heaven is going to see and know about all the times that you loved and you loved well. So judgment day for you and I as believers is a glorious day, a wonderful day to look forward to. That's why we have confidence. That's why we celebrate this. Because you've already graduated. You've already passed the test. It's now just receiving and collecting the rewards, the inheritance that God is longing to give you. It's not going to be a day of sadness and grief and tears. Even that idea there of, of seeing the stuff go up in loss, go up in, in, in smoke, when it says there they will, they will suffer a loss, it's not that he's going to take stuff away. He's not going to say, well, you did these five great things, so here are these five rewards, but you screwed up over here three times, so we're going to take those three away. No, the, the suffer loss just means forfeited opportunity. That's an interesting way to think of it, as a forfeited opportunity. Because each day I'm faced with an opportunity to maximize, to invest in loving people by trusting Jesus. And I'm, again, if I'm doing it for the reward, wrong motive. But if I'm doing it just to love people, it's a great opportunity. But if I miss that opportunity, then I'm going to miss out on what God has for me. And so what that tells us is what happens here on this side of eternity matters on the next side of eternity. I mean, think about it this way. That one act that one choice you made to place your faith in Jesus Christ, did that have an impact on your eternity? You bet it did. Well, small acts, small choices we make also has an impact on our eternity. Now, I, some people say, well, what's the reward, right? Is it, is it a, you know, get a nice house on the coast? Is it, you know, get lots of jewels, like a Mr. T starter said, if you did okay, and, and maybe the full Mr. T said, if you did really well, so, you know, lots of gold and jewels, and is it, is it money? Do I get to rule over my own little city? Do I get my own country? Do I get my own continent, my own planet? You know, I've been eyeing, you know, there's a planet way in another galaxy I've been looking. It's a far, far away I think they got some force over there. I'm, I'm, I think I'd be great over there, right? So, so is that what it is? is? Is that what the reward is? Maybe. Maybe. But you know what? I think there's better. I think there's a better reward than all of that. I think it's Jesus. I mean, I love what David said in Psalm 25. He says, this one thing that I long there's one thing that I desire for all the days of my life 
just to sit in your temple, to meditate on your word, and to gaze at your beauty. Basically what he's saying, God, I just want one thing. Can I hang out with you? Can I just be around you? Can I chat with you, talk with you, look at you, admire you? That's it. And I think that's the greatest reward is just hanging out with Jesus and just being with him and experiencing life with him for all of eternity because that's what he's desiring to give to us. So that's what brings us to our passage. See, all that was just introduction. So we got another hour to go, so make yourself comfortable. But, but Ephesians 2 and verse 7, that's our passage we want to study this morning. I'm not kidding. I'm kidding about the hour thing, right? But, but that's the passage we want to study. Let's start, though, in verse, well, verses 1 to 3. We, we studied that a little while ago, right? And it talked about basically how screwed up you and I all were. Right? When you and I showed up here on planet Earth, you were dead. You were following after Satan, after the course of this world. You were living and indulging in the flesh. And you were by nature children of wrath. You, they were, you were fundamentally flawed. You were messed up. You were screwed up. You were in bad shape. Right? That was the first three verses. And then verse 4 begins with, but God. But everything changes. Right? Everything flipped around based on this. Didn't matter that you were selfish and cruel and mean and drank Pepsi, but God. Right? God shows up. And what does he do? Being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us. Notice it had nothing to do with you and your potential. It wasn't about one day you're going to do something great and wonderful and you're going to pay back all that he's done for you and, and it's worth the investment and because you get more in the return. No, no, had nothing to do with you. It's just God is great. He's kind, he's merciful, he's compassionate, and he loves. It's what he does. And so what does he do? He rescues you and I. He rescues us by giving us new life. He took out the old man and crucified that old man with Jesus on the cross. Buried the old man. Goodbye, old man. Goodbye, sinful nature. Goodbye, old self. Brand new creation is raised up with him. You're made alive together with him. By grace, you've been saved. Had nothing to do with your works. God did it all. And then he's raised us up and he has seated you and I, as we saw last time, we are currently seated with him in heavenly places. You're already there. You've already made it. You've already got your place seated with him at the right hand of the Father. But why did he do all that? I mean, what was the purpose behind all that? That's verse 7. That's the last part there, the so that. So that in the ages to come, that's this age and the one to come, the rest of eternity. So basically from now till ever, this is what God's got planned. Have you ever pictured eternity? Have you ever thought about what life in heaven is going to be like? I mean, I've heard it this way. It's like this, this never-ending worship service. Oh, dear me. You don't want that. Because if you're near me, it's going to sound like the other place, not heaven. Right? Or we're all just sitting on clouds lounging away in our white gowns and our, and our, we gain wings somehow. I'm not sure why, but we have wings now as we all strum the harps like Deanne does. Is that heaven? I don't think so. I don't think so at all. What was God's plan? What's God's purpose? That's verse 7 again. He did all this. He rescued you. Why? So that in the ages to come, he might so show the surpassing riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. He went to hell and back. He suffered Calvary's cross so that he could love you, so that for all of eternity, he could love you and love you and love you and love you. He loved you so he could love you. Isn't that beautiful? For all of eternity, he just wants to lavish upon you how much love he has for you, Ethan. That's what he wants to give you over and over and over again through kindness, through compassion, through graciousness. That's it. That's what awaits us. 
Isn't that remarkable? Now, please understand, love is an action. Love is what you do. We've made love a feeling. We've sentimentalized it. And yeah, there is a feeling of love, but love is an action. Love is what you do as a response towards that. And so God is showering you and I with love. He's doing love. But his love is not the love of a sugar daddy. What's a sugar daddy? You good Christians don't know what a sugar daddy is, right? So let me explain to you what a sugar daddy is, right? John knows what a sugar daddy is. So, so a sugar daddy is someone who puts up someone, pays all their bills, all their expenses, makes sure they're happy and makes sure that everything's great and wonderful and, and showers gifts on them in exchange for services. That's what a sugar daddy is. And some have seen that's how, what God is. That God is going to look after our needs. He's going to provide for us. He's going to make sure that I'm happy and I'm content. And he's going to shower me with all these gifts in exchange for services. My trust in him, my faith in him, and so forth. So if I trust him and I do well, he's going to then bless me and make my life easy. That's not, God. That's not love. And that's not what God's doing. Love is doing what's in another person's best interest. And so, yes, God will provide and God will care for, but it's not in order to make life easy for you. Not so you're, you're all rich and fat and kind of living the high life. That's not real life. He's doing what you and I need, which is to experience life in him, to trust in him. And sometimes that will include some adversity. Sometimes it will include some challenges. But... He will always be there and he'll always be enough for the adversity and the challenge and the trial that you face because that's what love's doing. So let's conclude this then. In Hebrews 10, one, one more verse, Hebrews 10, verses 23 and 25, because I hope this gives us hope for today and hope for tomorrow. The writer here, he says, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. What's the confession of our hope? Jesus loves us. Jesus is in us. He's with us. He's going to care for us, provide for us, look after us on this side of eternity and the next. Let us hold on to that confession of hope without wavering. For he who promised is faithful. Let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds. Not forsaking our own assembling together as the habit of son, but encouraging one another all the more as you see the day drawing near. So what do we get to do? We get to come together and encourage one another to love. I know it's hard. I know what you're going through is difficult. I spent, I spent yesterday, uh, a good chunk of yesterday on the phone with a, with a guy, a friend of mine whose marriage is struggling. It's in rough shape. It's in bad shape. So angry, the two of them at each other. And all I was doing was just encouraging him. Keep trusting Jesus. Keep loving your wife. I know it's not easy. I know it's hard. I know it's difficult. But keep going. It's worth it. It's going to pay off in the end. So we get to do that to one another. We recognize it's hard. We recognize it's difficult. But we encourage you, keep going. Keep loving. Because it's, it's not all for nothing. It is going to be acknowledged. It's going to be recognized. And at the very least, it's the right thing to do. Keep doing it. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you that we don't have to be afraid. We don't have to be worried about this judgment day when we stand before the beam of seat of Christ. In fact, we get to look forward to that day with great anticipation. We're on that day. You're going to honor us. You're going to acknowledge us. You're going to love on us. We don't, we don't deserve any of it. And yet you choose to do so. So may we have confidence knowing that, that you love us perfectly and that love is never going to change. It's never going to diminish, but it's never going to increase because it's already perfect love. And if we can trust that perfect love, we can rest knowing that we're fully safe, fully secure in you. Thank you for what you've done. Now may you continue to encourage us especially in those times where it's difficult, especially in those times where we're tired or we're feeling hurt or we're feeling betrayed. Encourage us to love even those who seem to be unlovable. In your name we pray, amen.